I wanted to welcome you to the Redeemed Mind podcast, where you'll hear Bible commentary for Christian living. I'm your host, author and professor David W. Jones. In this podcast, you'll hear chapter by chapter teaching from the Word of God as we make our way through the biblical text. It's my prayer that the messages here will help you better understand the scriptures and will equip you to live the Christian life. If you're ready to begin, grab your Bible and a pen and paper, because here we go. If I remember uh, each, each week um, on my, my podcast, and I'll send a link out to that um, each week as well um, with the, the weekly email, but if you just can't get enough of uh, Dr. Jones, um, wherever you listen to podcasts, uh, The Redeemed Mind um, is my podcast, uh, and there's a, there's a bunch of stuff up there already. Uh, all right, Luke chapter chapter five uh, is going to be our our passage. Um, and so, last week we we looked at um, actually the past two weeks we, we've been in Luke Luke four, uh, and we've looked at the um, uh, the account of Christ being back um, back home in Nazareth and the uh, sort of uh, warm welcome he received back in his home synagogue <laughs> as they tried to to kill him. Um, and we went through that, and then we looked at the account of uh, a couple of miracles, uh, the casting out of some demons that Christ did, um, uh, some random ministry in Galilee, as well as uh, the healing uh, of, his, um, of Peter's mother-in-law as well. And so that brings us to Luke chapter 5. And so Jesus is still in the area of Galilee, uh, probably uh, up in the city of Capernaum, which is on the northern edge uh, of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and so extreme northern Israel. Uh, and this is the town uh, that's home to Peter and James and John and probably at least two or three of his other disciples. Uh, and he's ministering uh, in that, that region. And it, it tells us here in Luke 5, verse 1, it says, And so it was, as the multitude um, about him, or the pressed about him, to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennariset. And you're like, well, what in the world is the lake of Gennariset? Uh, well, the, um, as we read through the Gospels, it's interesting that the Gospel writers sort of all have their own name, uh, names for certain landmarks. And this is the, uh, the, the sea that I referred to earlier as the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and so Matthew uh, and um, Mark call this the Sea of Galilee. Interestingly, John calls this the Sea of Tiberias. And Luke calls it the Lake of Gennariset, right? And so was it a sea? Was it a lake? What was its name? Uh, it's all, all the same place, right? And as differing sort of peoples uh, conquered the area of, of Palestine, they would all kind of rename uh, landmarks with their own terminology, right? Uh, but Luke goes with its Greek name, which was the Lake of Gennariset, because Luke was uh, of Greek background. It says that as Jesus was here, uh, that he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. All right, so this is actually is an important uh, detail that's going to come up here in just a few verses. And so the way that fishermen uh, fish, right? It was, I mean, first of all, like, I think how sort of I have fished. Like I'm not a big fisherman, right? And I actually haven't been fishing since I was probably uh, 18 or something like that. But when I would fish, you know, I would kind of get my pole and I would go buy some worms at the store. Which is always sort of a bit disturbing when you could buy worms like in the in the case there with the with the cokes and everything else, right? But you could, you'd, I'd buy some worms and I would then yeah I'd go out to the the pond and you know about midday, and I would fish and I would I would catch nothing. Um, that was that's sort of how I think of fishing, right? But these folks here, Jesus' um, disciples, or at least most of them, were fishermen, and they weren't just sort of you know recreational fishermen like I'm describing, right? They were commercial fishermen, right? This is their job, right? So they had boats, they had nets. And the way that commercial fishermen would fish in this day and time is they would fish at night, right? And you say, well, why would they fish at night? Well, um, as uh, the folks that know about this uh, have written um, and have informed me that essentially uh, the fishing was better at night, right? Because this is a hot uh, area of the world um, and they would go and they would fish at night because the fish would come up to the, near, near the surface at night. And this is a really deep lake. Matter of fact, this is the, the lowest body of freshwater um, uh, that there is in the world, still is to this, this day, uh, and one of the deepest uh, lakes or sea uh, you know, in, in this part of the world as well. And so the fish would kind of go down deep in the bottom during the day, stay cool. At night, they would come up towards the surface, right? And there near the surface, these folks could 
catch them uh, with their nets, right? Because again, in, in their, they were commercial fishermen, but they were commercial fishermen in the first century, right? And so we're not talking about huge cranes and diesel powered boats, right? We're talking about wooden boats, carry eight men at the most, and nets that would go down, you know, maybe 20 feet, something like that, right? Well, they'd been out all night um, fishing uh, and th they caught nothing. And now they are back home, it's probably mid-morning, they're washing their nets, and of course you would need to wash your nets to keep them from decaying. And this is how Jesus finds these men, verse three. And then Jesus got into one of the boats, because they were now available, because the guys aren't fishing anymore, uh, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And Jesus sat down, and he taught the multitude from the boat. And so if you've ever been on the water, right, whether it's, you know, you're out in, on the ocean or on a lake, you've probably noticed that, you know, being on, um, on water, it serves as a great amplifier, right? Because it's flat and sound can travel. And if you're on a, a lake that's surrounded by, you know, by some mountains and hills, it's even that much more amplification, right? So this is just sort of a, a matter of utility, of practicality. Jesus is trying to speak. There's large crowds. They're pressing against him. Not everyone can hear him. So he goes out uh, a bit from shore on a boat and makes use of this natural amplification, this speaking and teaching, and everyone's listening to his, his sermon. Now, I, sh I should maybe kind of note this maybe sort of as a, as a side note. In, in verse 3 there, it says that this was Simon's boat that he, had, uh, that he was on. And so, of course, this is Simon Peter. And this actually is the very first mentioning of Peter, apart from the mention of his mother-in-law back in the previous chapter that we have in Luke's gospel. Right? And so we all know that Peter becomes one of uh, the, the kind of the, the chief disciples, right? And we all know, you know, how Peter sort of ascends in ministry even after Christ's death. Um, you know, he wasn't the first pope. Don't have time to chase that now, right? But he becomes a real important um, guy, right? Well, this is his first kind of real interaction with Christ. That's recorded, uh, at least by, by Luke. Now, maybe I should actually say this. Now, this actually is not the actual the first interaction that Peter has with Jesus. If you look over, actually, I mean, actually, don't turn there. I'll just read it to you. Over in John chapter 1, actually, there is a narrative that occurred prior to this that Luke actually leaves out of his narrative, and John includes, and of course all the gospel writers have their own sort of um, agendas and own emphases, and they all complement each other. Uh, and so John includes this narrative that I think that you're familiar with, as I read it to you here, in John 1, verse 35. Uh, it says, again, the next day, John stood with his two disciples. So this is the day after Jesus' baptism that we read about back in Luke chapter three, right? And so Luke doesn't include this, but John does. It says, in looking at Jesus um, as he walked, John said, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples uh, heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And then Jesus turned and seeking, uh, seeing them, asked, what do you seek? And they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Logical question, right? Like, you know, where are you lodging? I guess they wanna go and maybe sort of lodge with him, stay nearby. And Jesus said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. And one of the two who heard, was, uh, who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. And now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone, right? So this all had happened weeks before this narrative back in Luke 5. And so all this to say that Peter knew Jesus, Jesus knew Peter, but Peter was not yet uh, a formal disciple uh, of, of Jesus. And of course, being there in the same small town, uh, Peter had heard Jesus speak. Obviously, Jesus had healed his mother-in-law. Whether he wanted him to or not, he did, right? Uh, and they come across each other again now uh, on this morning, uh, and Peter borrows, or rather Jesus borrows Peter's boat. So Luke 5, verse 4. And when Jesus had stopped speaking, so the, the message was over. Interesting that Luke doesn't actually record anything of Jesus' sermon, uh, but he stopped speaking. Yet Jesus said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, I can just sort of imagine, you know, again, I always like to sort of, you know, bring this up. And I've told you all before that, you know, once I get to heaven, I'm going to meet all these guys and I'm going to watch the videos 
uh, of this stuff, right? Because um, it, this is so sort of intriguing to me, just kind of to, to you know to go and to watch this stuff. I'm hoping that there's kind of like a like a 3D kind of hologram thing. We can actually go and kind of like you know see it, you know, not just watch it, but kind of you know see all these things take place. I want to see like the flood and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but these are real people, right? I mean, just like you and I. Uh, and it was it was probably a hot day, right? And Peter has been out toiling all night. Uh, it hasn't been a, a good day at work, if you will, right? Because they've he's worked all night long. He's tired. He has nothing to show uh, from all of his uh, his labor, right? And so it's been a bad day at work. You know, they're hot. They're tired. Uh, probably, you know, the the coworkers are snippy, right? Because you know they haven't caught anything. Uh, and there's Jesus wants to borrow the boat, and so you you know Jesus because you've been around him. He's healed your mother-in-law. He asks if he can borrow your boat, and you're like, okay, you can borrow the boat, right? And so Jesus goes and he gives this message, uh, message over. And if I'm Peter, I'm thinking, well, you know, praise the Lord, uh, he's done, and I can now I can now dock the boat, and I can go uh, and finally go home and get some sleep because it's been a really long day and I'm tired, right? And what does Jesus tell you to do? He says, I want you to launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, okay, I, again, I'm going to watch, go look on Peter's face, you know, at this moment, right? And I can just sort of see it. It's like this look of, like, exasperation, right? <laughs> because um, here's this guy, right, the, um, who maybe you've met a few times, right? And you know him as, like, a traveling evangelist, right? And he's like, you know, and like, I mean, traveling evangelists, like, what do you think about traveling evangelists? Like, you're like, oh, these guys have soft hands, might shake your hand, like they've never done a day's work in their life, right? Kind of a bit suspicious, right? I mean, but whatever you think about them, certainly, you know, like this guy's not a fisherman. Like you're a fisherman, right? Like you've been fishing all night. And why have you been fishing all night? Because you're a fisherman and you know how to fish and you, you know where to fish, you know when to fish. And this, this preacher tells you it's time now to go fishing. Right, uh, and so of course, like you know, if you're a fisherman, right? So if, if there's any sort of hope for catching fish during this this day and time, man, it's 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 gonna it's gonna be um, way down deep, right? Where your nets can't reach, right? And, and so this guy says, yeah, I mean, go out into the deep. He means actually go out a little further from shore than where he was speaking, right? And so like go out. And put the nets down. And you're thinking, like, this, this guy doesn't know how to fish. Right? Like, I mean, like, yeah, I've heard that he was a carpenter. But, like, he's a carpenter. Or he's a preacher. He's not a fisherman. Right? And yet he's commanding this. But you have seen the effects of his ministry. Right? You've seen some of the folks uh, who have been perhaps healed. You've seen um, a demon being cast out. That's just happened. You, you know that your mother-in-law was, was just healed of her issue. And so... You have some level of respect, maybe, for this man, but yet you're still tired, and you still want to go home and sleep, and the carpenter evangelist has still told you how to do your job, right? And so, verse 5, But Simon answered and said to him, and I think this is how he said it, Master, man, we've toiled all night, and we're sick and tired, right? <laughs> and we've caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Right? So like, okay, I'm going to do what you said just to show you that you don't know what you're talking about. Right? You know? And that's, that's, that's I think, probably what... Now, maybe Peter's more spiritual than me. Right? Uh, and maybe he was just sort of all in. And he just sort of just assumed something is great, something great is going to happen. Because this guy, uh, he just knows everything about everything. Uh, and this is going to work out. Right? And so... Maybe that's what he thought, but, but I doubt it. But we can all sort of you know, watch the video together and, and we can see if I'm right or not, right? And so that's, that's, the, that's the command. Verse 6, And when they had done this, they, that is Peter and the guys in this boat, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. Well, how many, how many fish actually was this? I tried to find this out. It doesn't actually tell us in the, in the narrative. But um, probably thousands of fish. Right? I mean, the, um, the, the phrase here, I'm reading uh, New King James, it says that, that they caught a, a great number of fish. The word there is like an astonishing amount. Like this is like, the, this is like the largest number of fish that they have ever actually seen, right? Verse 7, so that they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them, right? And so more than one boat, they fish together. 
And so they called their partners out, you know, to, I mean, help us, you know, get these nets in, like they're breaking. And they came and they filled both the boats so that they began to sink, right? I mean, this is like a, a, a massive number of fish that is, is caught. And so I, I love this, right? The, um, now, maybe Peter is a little more spiritual than I think he is, right? Because I, I think if I'm Peter, and if Peter is like I think he is, I think when this happens, I think I'm going to be like, thanks, Jesus, like for the fish, right? Kind of like maybe in my mind, I'm thinking like, I lent you the boat, and you paid me back with some fish, right? And so like, it's a kind of a tit for tat, right? But verse eight, listen to Peter. And so when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Uh, that's an appropriate reaction. Right to, to to this right because and so the, why does Peter have this reaction? Well, Peter has this reaction because Peter is a fisherman, and Peter knows that what has just happened cannot be explained by anything other than something divine, miraculous happening. Right? I mean, this I mean this this is the largest catch of fish that you've ever seen in your life. You've caught it at the wrong time in the wrong place, uh, and at the word of this carpenter, itinerant evangelist. Right. And so something clicks in Peter's mind. Now, does Peter actually know yet at this point in his life that this actually is the Son of God? I don't think so, actually, because actually, you know, the the word here that is um, that is used for Lord. So this is not. Now, you you notice this in your your Bibles, right? That sometimes when the word Lord appears, it's just capital L O R D. Right? Sometimes when it appears, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Right. And the difference there uh, in our English translations between all the capitals or just the capital L is this, that the word here in in the text, Lord, this is just kind of the word for for master, for ruler, for one who's in charge. Right. You know, it says over Peter says that um, Sarah called Abraham Lord. Right. That's that's kind of this word like Lord, master. I'll probably get Dawn to call me Lord for years now. She she won't do it yet. Right. (laughs) But that's like, you know. Uh, you know, leader, right? But capital L O R D, right? That's actually God's covenant name, right? In in the Old Testament, Yahweh, and right? it comes across in the, the New Testament as well, right? Well, that's not the word that's actually used here. Uh, it's not Yahweh. It's not Lord and Master, God, Creator, Son of God. It's just sort of uh, leader, master, one who's done a miraculous thing, right? And so I, I don't think here that. Peter has yet, it's clicked yet, that this actually is God. I think he just knows that, hey, this is something that is supernatural and great and something that's unexplainable. And Peter, uh, being aware that he's in the presence of a great man, uh, of maybe a divine act, um, and knowing himself right, as being a, a sinful man, thus he declares, like, depart from me, right? Depart from me. And I think I mentioned a few weeks back even this, this idea, if I, if I, you know, I'll keep saying the same thing over and over again, you'll know if you keep coming back each, each week. You know, I, I think back to, um, I remember um, Tony Rudel, the, uh, the, there's a, a church that we were at years ago, um, and there was a guy in, named Tony Rudel who literally was there every week um, for, I think, 12 years that I taught there and didn't miss a week. He used, to, he used to come make coffee for us and everything was great. By the way, if God's moving you to make coffee for us each week, you know, it, it's, it's open. The, uh, the job is. But... Um, when, when, I, when I left that church, as I was leaving like my, my last week, Tony said to me, he, he said, you know, I've been here like every week for like a decade, right? He said, I've come to realize that you pretty much say the same thing every week. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, well, I, thank you, I, I think. Or it was, a, is that a criticism? You know, he's like, he's like, no, I mean, that, that's a good thing. Like, you just say the Bible to us each week. Well, I, I also tell the same story, so we're over again, right? So the, um, the, the story that came to mind was this. It's, it's this teaching in the Old Testament. That the um, and and you've come across it. It's a teaching that no man can see God and live, right? And you've come across that, right? And people are always afraid to see God, right? Um, because no man can see God and live. And sometimes when, when we read that, we think that the teaching is that like if we were to see God as human beings, like that God is so holy, that God is so great, that somehow it would kind of it would like blow our minds, right? Because He's so holy, and we just kind of would die, right? Uh, well. No, no. The, the teaching actually in the Old Testament is is this, and bear in mind that these were these were Jews uh, who had the Old Testament as their Bible, right? The teaching was that if 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 you and I, if if a man was to see God, 
that God is so holy and he has so much light that his light would so illuminate uh, to us our sinfulness, right? I mean, our corruption, the fact that we are sinful people, that our knowledge of our sin is what would kill us, right? So it wasn't God's holiness that blew your mind. It was your own self-awareness of your own sinful heart that would kill you, right? And, and, and you've kind of had this sort of work like in your life in the past, I know. Like, you know people who are more holy than you are, right? The, um, and so kind of when you're around them, even if like you aren't talking about necessarily sort of like spiritual things, there's just sort of like a holiness that kind of shines off some people. And it starts like convicting you, like of your own sin, right? Like you're around people that you know, love Jesus more than you, and I'm like, gosh, I'm a terrible dad. I'm a, I'm a terrible husband. I need to be a better person, right? Well, that's the phenomena, right? That's taking place here. And so Peter, uh, he he knows that something is here that is divine. Thus, his conclusion, like depart from me, essentially, like like the knowledge of myself that's coming being in front of you, Jesus, that this is killing me. So depart, right? That's that's his reaction. Verse 9, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish, which they had taken. Well, they were astonished because it's the biggest catch of fish they've ever seen. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid, for now on you, for, for now on you, you will become, um, you will start to catch men, right? And so you're been a fisher of fish, but now you're going to be a, a fisher of, of men. I, I wonder if Peter thought about this this encounter with Christ, you know, back over in, in Acts three, right? When he's when he preaches at Pentecost, and thousands of people come to faith in Christ. I wonder if he's like, oh yes, that's what Jesus meant when he talked about being a fisher of men. Verse eleven, and this is even more astonishing, right? And so when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and they followed him. Isn't that amazing? Like, they've just caught, like, the biggest catch of fish they've ever seen in their lives. And so what do they do? They leave it all and follow Jesus, right? The, uh, and so, um, and I'm not sure that would, that would have been, you know, I think I would have wanted to maybe sell the fish first or something. I don't know, right? But that's not what, 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 they, what they do. But this is what happens when you realize that you're in the presence of, of Christ. And, and so there's, there's a lot here, I think, that we can talk about. And I've heard really a lot of really bad sermons on this passage. So I heard one not too long ago, about a year ago. I won't tell you where. wasn't here. Um, but I heard I heard a sermon on this passage, and the um, the pastor's um, his main point was this: it, it was that if you just do so, what Jesus tells you to do, like in your job, you know, like if you just do what Jesus tells you to do, like in your job, so you'll be successful. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no, that that's not. The point of the passage, right? The uh, and you know sometimes you can actually do what Jesus will tell you to do, like in your job, and it'll mean you actually will get fired, right? And like like there's no promise that if you just obey Scripture and obey Christ, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Right? That, that's the prosperity gospel. That's that's heresy, right? Uh, but it, that's that's okay, right? Because that you don't have to be successful. It's all you need to be is faithful. Right? Uh, and if you're faithful, as God counts success, so you will be successful. And maybe some of you ha- actually have experienced this even. The, uh, I remember a job I was at at one time. The, uh, I did landscaping all the way through uh, college and graduate school. And I, I worked for this guy uh, who seemed to be a good guy, but he ended up being a real scoundrel. Right? The, uh, and a, a couple things uh, I remember he did. Uh, like one time we um, we were working down in Raleigh and we were putting out pine straw um, at, for this large corporation and um, we, we we put out about a hundred bales of pine straw uh, and we were selling them for like five bucks a bale plus labor and um, he gave me the bill to give to the guy um, that owned the corporation and on the bill I said that we had put out eleven hundred bales of pine straw and I'm like no it was only a hundred he's like no it was eleven hundred just tell him it was eleven hundred right I'm like. Like we are way over billing this guy, right? You know, for our materials. The um, and then another time, we um, there was a guy that worked for us that did all like the the uh, pest control and the, the spraying and stuff. And we were at a, um, a subdivision actually here in Wake Forest that I won't name that has a really nice um, entrance to it. With all, had like several thousand dollars of shrubbery, uh, and our, our landscaping guy 
uh, came to work and he obviously had a bad weekend and had, was still a little hungover and he, he put the wrong chemical in the sprayer and he, he sprayed all these several thousand dollars worth of shrubs um, with a, um, a chemical that, uh, that killed them. It didn't actually protect them from bugs, right? The, um, and, um, but the chemical, it, it wouldn't actually show uh, for about a month. And the contract that we had was up and two weeks later. So my boss just didn't actually bid on the contract for the following year. Someone else got it and all the shrubs died, right? The, um, and I was like, so I had to confront him and then, you know, and ended up losing my job. Well, I wasn't very successful, and I was unemployed, right? You know, but I think I actually, I, I think I actually did what, what God would have me do, right? The, um, and, and so that's not the takeaway here, right? I mean, the takeaway of this passage is not necessarily to tell you um, how to behave tomorrow at, at work. This passage is about Jesus uh, revealing Himself to, to Peter, to Simon, right? The, uh, and so there's a bunch more there, but let me move on here for the sake of time. And so we come across here um, an, another another miracle that. Is uh, is performed uh, here by by Christ, and this is the um, this is a miracle that details for us the, the healing of a, of a leper. Now, you know, I, I guess sort of if someone was to ask me, like, you know, how often does Jesus sort of heal you know, heal lepers, like in the Gospels? Like in my mind, it's kind of like it happens like almost like every other miracle, right? You know, because I mean, lepers, I guess, kind of lepers stand out to me because. Leprosy is not like a, a major deal in our context, right? So when we come across a leper in Scripture, it kind of it, it sticks out in my mind. And of all Jesus, Jesus' miracles, Jesus does 37 miracles. I mean, 22 of them are healing miracles, right? And so most of Christ's miracles actually involve healing. And so I would think that a lot of his healing miracles deal with lepers. Uh, and so I, I chased this down. This is actually just one of two instances in Scripture uh, where Jesus actually heals a leper. Right? There's, there's this narrative, uh, and then there's the healing of the ten lepers uh, that will come across in Luke 17 that you're probably aware of. Remember, nine went away and one came back, right? I think there's a song even about that I've heard uh, that we said some of our kids. But uh, just, just, just twice does, does Christ heal leprosy. And really, even in the Old Testament, there's only two healings of leprosy as well. There's the healing of Miriam, remember? Uh, Moses' sister Miriam uh, has leprosy, she gets healed. And then there's the healing of, of Naaman, uh, whom Jesus mentioned in his sermon back in Luke 4, right? And so there's only four times in Scripture where leprosy is actually healed. Uh, but this is going to be, be one of them. And so you say, well, what is leprosy, right? Well, you've probably never met um, a, a leper, Um Although leprosy is actually maybe a little more prevalent in the world than we might first assume. Um, there's actually about a quarter million cases of leprosy that are diagnosed every year in the world. Um, but only about a hundred of them are actually in our country. Most of them occur in India and Brazil, um, are, the, are the, the top two countries with leprosy. But a lot of people actually are diagnosed with leprosy. We actually, we call leprosy today Hansen's disease. Um, and if you have notes in your Bible, you might even have a note about that. But essentially Hansen's disease or leprosy uh, it was a disease, it is a disease, that it gradually starts to kill um, the, the nerve endings, right? Starting with the extremities of your body and working their way inward. And really even in Christ's day, nobody uh, would die of leprosy, although lepers would die all the time, but it wasn't that you would die of leprosy, it's that your extremities would start to become numb, and then you would start to, you know, bang your hands, cut your fingers, etc., etc., right? The, uh, and uh, because of some other injury that you incurred, because of your lack of the ability to feel, uh, would then bring about your death. The, uh, and really one of the most feared uh, diseases in the biblical times was leprosy. And it was feared because it was fairly prevalent. And it was feared because it was uh, nearly always eventually fatal. Uh, and when you read back through the Old Testament, what you see is that if somebody had leprosy, because leprosy is contagious, um, it's contagious essentially uh, somewhere near the degree of pink eye is today, so a very contagious disease, um, that if you were a leper, that you were actually separated, right? And lepers sort of dwelt with other lepers, uh, and if you had leprosy, and someone who didn't have leprosy was you know, near you, you had to yell out, unclean, unclean, so they would stay away from you, right? The, uh, and you were kind of put in a leper colony, kind of by yourself, separated uh, within the Jewish um, uh, society. 
uh, you were barred uh, from entering the temple, sort of among other things, right? Uh, and sort of a very kind of socially ostracizing disease that usually led to death. Well, Jesus is going to encounter here a man with, with leprosy. And it's interesting here, it just um, how this narrative unfolds. Luke 5, verse 12, it says, And it happened when Jesus was in a certain city, uh, so again, probably still Capernaum or somewhere there around the Sea of Galilee, that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. And I, I like this phrase here, full of leprosy, because this is Dr. Luke kind of uh, coming through, right? And so Luke communicates that this, this man didn't just have sort of a, a new case of leprosy. This man, he was full of leprosy, right? This, this was a, a terminal case. Like he was near the end, right? And, and so a very, very severe case of leprosy. That he saw Jesus. I, just, I love this man's reaction, right? You know, rather than acting as, in a sense, he was supposed to act, right? You avoided people who didn't have leprosy, right? You yelled out unclean, rather than kind of following those, those laws, that when he saw Jesus, he fell down at his face. And so he approaches Jesus. He comes to Jesus, a non-leper, and he implores him. And he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. I, so I, 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 can't, I, I love this, this reaction. In, you know, over in, um, in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 8, verse 2, when Matthew gives the same narrative, uh, at this point, Matthew tells us that this man began to worship Jesus. Right? And so whether or not Peter had saving faith, I think this man did. Right? And, and this man had such sort of faith in Jesus that he would worship him, Matthew 8, 2. You only worship God, right, if, you, if you're doing it right, right? So he's worshiping Jesus, and he, he has faith. In, he believes, Lord, you can make me clean. I'm like, you can heal me. And really, how does this man actually, how does he know this? And like, what has he heard? Has he, has he been sort of at the outskirts of Christ's teaching? Has he heard about, you know, Peter's mother-in-law? Has, um, has, he, has he heard tale of the demons? that were cast out of a man uh, back in, in Luke 4, 31. Uh, we're just not told. Uh, but somehow, some way, this, this man actually has faith such in Jesus that he'll worship him, and he'll openly declare, like, you can heal me. So while he's clear, and while he believes, while he has faith that Jesus can heal him, what he doesn't know is, Lord, if you're willing. Like, if you're willing. And, and this really actually... Maybe sort of a, um, it may be sort of a helpful, in, in one sense, sort of caveat for us, right? Because I, I hope, I, I trust that to a lesser or greater extent, I hope all of us would believe that, you know, Jesus can, can move in our lives, right? That Jesus can heal us, right? And indeed, he can, right? But what we don't know is if he will right now, right? And I think one of the problems is, is when we just assume that you will heal me if I ask, we just, we just assume that that's the case, that that actually sort of puts us in charge of our lives rather than putting Christ in charge of our lives, right? And so while we all need to believe that he can, and he invites us to cast all of our cares, all of our anxieties upon him, and ask him you know, whatever we, we, we want, right? And we need to do that with faith. We need to realize that you know, our timetable might not be God's timetable. Right, the uh, that one day we'll all have glorified bodies, right, and, and nothing will hurt anymore. Amen to that, right? But you know, God's God's never late, but He's rarely early. You know what I'm saying, right? Uh, and so, like your timetable might not be God's timetable. And I think that sometimes we can be guilty of coming to God with with presumption, right? Uh, and so, again, I'm not saying that. Don't overhear me. I'm not saying it's wrong to ask God for healing or for whatever it is we need. I'm saying that we just need to submit to his timetable, right? He's Lord, we're not. This man, he submits, and so he knows that God can. But he asks, you know, if, you know, he admits that he doesn't know if he will, at least then and there. And again, I just, I love the presumption of the man coming to Christ. But I love even more Christ's response. And then he, this is verse 13, Jesus put out his hand and he touched him and said, I am willing to be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And I just sort of wonder, it wasn't just sort of like the, in my mind at least, it wasn't just sort of the healing of leprosy. I think it was the complete restoration of his body, right? Because he, he is full of leprosy, right? And he's already got, you know, scars and, 
you know, things missing, <laughs> they have fallen off or been cut off or whatever. And I think he's just immediately healed once and for all. And so I just, I wonder what it must even have been like for this man, right? I mean, this is probably the first time in decades that somebody who wasn't another leper touched him, right? And so just to, to feel the touch of another human being, right? And to just sort of be in the presence uh, of one like Christ and then to be, to be healed, right? I mean, it just must have been incredible, incredible moments. And I can't wait to, again, see this, this video in heaven. But just for, verse 14, interestingly, but maybe not unexpectedly, because this is, this is the pattern we've seen already. And Jesus charged him to tell no one. But he says, but go immediately and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. Uh, and I think verse 15 kind of tells us a bit why uh, this is what Christ said. He says, however, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear him and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And so again, we talked about this back in chapter 3, that one of the reasons, I think, why Jesus always has this, it's called the, the Messianic secret, where he, where he tells people, like, Shh, like, don't tell anyone about me. Like, don't tell anybody what I just did, especially in regard to miracles. It, it, I think there's a matter of utility to it, right? You know, where he's just, he wants to sort of, he wants to keep teaching and have freedom to move about uh, and to, to spread the gospel. And if everyone's just coming to him for healing, right, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to be able to move around, right? Uh, which is exactly what what happened. And so hence there's the command, well, hey, don't go and tell everyone, but rather I want you to go and I want you to keep the Old Testament law about what it is you're supposed to do when you're healed from leprosy. Right? And you're like, well, what is that that, that he was to do? Well, I'm not going to read it to you, but you can go and read if you want to in Leviticus, if you can find Leviticus. In Leviticus 14, there's actually an entire chapter uh, in, um, in the law that, that tells people who were healed from leprosy, or who or at least maybe thought they were healed from leprosy, what they were actually to do. And it involved going to the priest, and making an offering, going back and forth over some time. And there was really sort of a bunch that you were, you were supposed to do uh, if you um, had been healed, or at least believed you had been healed of leprosy. Again, that was Leviticus chapter 14. The whole chapter is, is about that. And let me kind of maybe just kind of throw in here, just maybe on, on the side, I mean, something... Uh, to uh, something that I think is in play here. Um, you know, Jesus actually never breaks the law, right? The matter of fact, he says um, back in Matthew 5, verse 17, he says, do not think I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill, right? And so Jesus didn't come to like do away with the law. He came to actually fulfill the law, right? And I bring that up because sometimes... Christians are, are, are moved kind of to think. It, it's almost like we almost have like two Bibles. Like there's like the Old Testament, and in, that, in those books, you know, we have this sort of God of wrath and law. And in the New Testament, we have, you know, this God of love and the gospel. And we kind of have these, this, this in, our, in our one book, the Bible, but there's these like different parts that don't really fit together well. No. <laughs> no. Right? The whole thing fits together, right? There's a unity to it, right? And Jesus actually doesn't um, he doesn't break any law. He actually affirms the law. Uh, he confirms the law. Uh, he doesn't destroy it at all by his own, his own testimony. And let me just actually even just kind of throw out there a few things. And, and we can actually revisit this uh, later on. I'm sure, I'm sure we will. But, you know, when you, when you read through the, um, the Old Testament, there's a bunch of laws there, right? I mean, like, well, the book of Leviticus, it's a hard book to make it through, right? I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of laws there. Book of Numbers, right? A lot of stuff there. But when, when you read through um, all of the various laws that we have in the Old Testament, uh, and even some in the New, um, all the laws generally can be put into one of three categories. Right? The, uh, and here's the, here's the categories of law that we find in the Bible. The first category is what we would call moral laws. Right? And when I, when I say moral laws... In your mind, like think of think of the Ten Commandments, right? You know, laws that were given that um, are not tied down to any particular time or context or culture. That they're they're always applicable to mankind in every age and in every part of the world, right? 
things like you know, don't murder, right? don't commit adultery, right? don't covet. Right? These are just laws that are, are moral in nature, that are sort of like the blueprint for Christian living. That they tell us, um, essentially, what God is like and what we are to do. And what, what I mean by that is, is this. Um, like when God gives moral laws, and this actually might be sort of important to think through um, if this has never occurred to you before. When, when we read, like again, say Ten Commandments, like when God says, I want you to, um, to not commit adultery, right? And that's a big one, the Seventh Commandment, right? It, it, it's not like God was up there in heaven saying, like, should I tell them commit adultery or don't commit adultery? We're going to go with don't commit adultery, right? And let, like, no, God's moral laws like, are not haphazard, right? All of God's moral laws, they all reflect, they reveal to us who God is and what he's like. Right? In other words, when God says don't commit adultery, he's actually revealing himself to us because God is faithful to those with whom he's intimate. Right? And we, who are made in God's image, right? um, so we were made in order to reflect God and to function in a sense like God. We're made in his image, right? And so he made us to be faithful to those with whom we're intimate. And thus God says, hey, what I'm like, I'm faithful to those with whom I'm intimate, whether it be your spouse uh, or your, your boss or your coworkers. I mean, everyone with whom you're in a relationship, you know, we're to be faithful to them. Because that's what God's like. When we do that, like when, you, when you're faithful to those with whom you're intimate, that's when actually you experience joy and flourishing and, and contentment. Because that was actually the song you were made to sing because you're made in God's image. And that's what God's like. Whereas like when you commit adultery, if you ever have, or when you're not faithful to a friend, right? The, um, or, or whatever it is. Um, so you always feel guilty uh, and life doesn't go well for you, right? The, uh, or when someone is not faithful to you, that's when you feel betrayed and you're unhappy, right? It's because like that's not the blueprint. That's not how people were made to interact with each other. And, and all of God's moral laws are like that, right? And God says, I want you to, not steal. You know, why? Because God is a faithful steward of all that he's over. We're made in his image, so we're to be good stewards of all that we're over. And when you steal, like you're a bad steward, like you're trying to steward someone else's stuff, right? And so I mean, all God's moral laws, they all reflect, they reveal who he is, what he's like, and they're the rules that'll make your heart sing if you keep them, right? Those are God's moral laws, right? Well, a second category of laws are what we could call civil laws, right? The, um, and so when you take God's moral laws, again, think Ten Commandments, and you actually kind of put wheels on them in a particular culture, in a particular time, you can generate sort of new laws that describe how God's moral laws fit into your time and culture. Right? And so, for example, like the Jews had a law, one of their many civil laws, that said um, it, when you build your buildings, um, so kind of like a building code, like when you build your, your homes, I want you to build a fence around the, the roof of your home, right? And you read that and you're like, well, gosh, is that something that we should be doing? You know, like, like, should I have a fence around the roof of my home? Well, well, no. I mean, the reason why the Jews had fences around the roof of their homes was because they lived in flat roofed dwellings, right? Uh, and when you build your home, you want to build it in such a way that respects innocent life so you're not murdering people, right? And it's because the Jews used their roofs as a place to keep warm in the sun during the winter or to keep cool in the summer because of the breeze, they would build a fence around it so people don't fall off and die. And so you see like the civil law about building a fence around the roof of your home that we read in Deuteronomy 29 is actually just the six commandments, don't murder, or respecting human life put into their time and culture, right? In every civil law, Every just civil law is just, a, it's the moral law put into a time and culture, right? And so you don't have to worry about, you know, building a fence around the roof of your home, right? But as Rich is finishing off his basement and putting in his, you know, his, his sockets and his wall, right? So, like, there's a, there's a building code that we have that he has to follow. I hope you're doing it, right? You know, it's where you're putting the outlets in right and you're grounding them, right? You know, so when Sandy goes to plug in, you know, her, her computer, like, she doesn't die, right? And see, it's the same thing. It's just the Sixth Commandment. Don't murder. Show respect for life. Like, why are your outlets in a certain way, right? 
And the Jews weren't responsible for that, for that civil law. That's our civil law. That's our time, our culture. They didn't have electricity, right? Or outlets. Um, and so you, you see, civil laws are just moral laws put into a particular time and culture. That's all they are, right? And civil laws in, in, the, in the Old Testament, they don't relate to you and me because we're not Jews living in the first millennia B.C., right? But we have our own civil laws that we need to follow, but they're all contingent upon that moral law, right? Well, the third category of law in the Bible is what's called ceremonial laws, right? And the ceremonial laws were laws that were given that essentially communicated truths about how people are to approach God, right? about how they were to construct the tabernacle, the temple, how they were to put together their priestly garb, uh, what festival days they were to keep, um, what foods they could eat and not eat, and all these sort of ceremony things, right? And the law here that Jesus tells this man in Luke 5 to keep about leprosy, this actually was a ceremonial law, right? Uh, and in the Old Testament, leprosy, because it was so contagious and it always produced death when you caught it, leprosy was a picture of sin, right? Uh, and so um, by way of the ceremony that they had, thus, you know, lepers were to be kept separate and to be kept apart and you were to watch out for them and not touch them because leprosy was a picture of, of sin, right? And all their various ceremonial laws that they had regarding how they were to worship God, while there may be sort of like some, some practicality to them, like if, you, like if you know someone that has leprosy, like you might want to not give them a hug, right? I mean, like today, right? I mean, there's, there's practicality to that. That's not our ceremonial law, right? But we have our own ceremonial laws, right? I mean, like, like we do actually, like, I mean, you, like this church has its own ceremonial laws. Like they're just not written down anywhere, but they're, I mean, they're, they're there. I mean, like, if you don't believe me, like, I mean, just like, we have like a ceremonial law that says that like Pastor Stephen, he preaches for 35 minutes. That's pretty much a law. And like, if you don't believe that, like if he was to go two hours, just like see what happens. Right? I mean, it's going to be very clear he's broken a law. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, I mean, like, I mean, even things like, you know, like churches, like, they have laws about, like, I don't know, like the offering, you know, like it goes after, like, the second hymn, you know, and, like, you move it, like, after the third hymn, and, like, you're going to get a visit from the deacons, pastor, you know, like, they're like, no, you, you did it wrong, right? Or, like, how you dress, you know, like, you get a dress a certain way, even, you know, like, it's, I mean, like, this church has, like, a, we have ceremonial laws about how you're supposed to dress, right? Like, I guarantee, like, if I was to show up, like, next week to church in, like, in a three-piece suit, like, there, there'd be some comments. Because you're like, apparently, like, you didn't get the, the ceremonial law about the, the dress code. Because, like, we don't, we don't do that here. Like, you know, where's your polo shirt? You know, like, where's your shorts? Like, whatever. You know, like, there's, like, certain parameters of, like, you know, the dress we, that are acceptable. And when you violate that, it's like, mm -hmm, look at that guy, right? Oh, well, they had their ceremonial laws. We have our ceremonial laws. And Jesus here, he, he tells this Jew, this leper who was healed, I want you to go and, and keep that ceremonial law, right? Because that ceremonial law, it did regulate uh, worship in their context, right? So he's, in, he's endorsing the laws that were there in their, their place and time. And so this man then is, is healed. And that brings us to the, uh, this last healing. We have um, 12 minutes left. It's the healing of a, of a paralytic. Uh, and this is also a story that I know that you're familiar with because it's recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this actually is, is an important uh, healing, an important parable, uh, not parable, uh, miracle in, in Christ's teaching, in Luke's gospel especially, because this actually is going to be the very first time in Luke's gospel where, where we see Jesus actually butting heads with the Pharisees. Matter of fact, the Pharisees are going to be mentioned for the very first time here in verse 17. Right? And so up until this point in time, everything's been going great in Christ's ministry. Right? But all of a sudden, he starts to hit a wall right? and starts butting up against these, these leaders because he, he wasn't acting as he was supposed to act, in their minds at least. And so here's what it says in Luke 5 and verse 16. It says, and so Jesus himself often withdrew into the wilderness and he, and he prayed. And this is one of the secrets to spiritual strength. It's Bible intake and prayer, right? Um, verse 17. It says, now it happened on a certain day as Jesus was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them, right? And so 
the a word has spread to the Pharisees uh, and the scribes and the lawyers, we'll see later on. Uh, and they've actually, they've heard about this guy, Jesus, and what he's been teaching, what he's been doing. And so they all come out kind of to see uh, about what's going on. Verse 18, Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, who they uh, sought to bring in and lay before Jesus. But when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down uh, with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And this actually is really like, this is like the, actually the second Bible teaching I can ever recall hearing in, in, my, uh, in my life. I must have been maybe four years old, and, and I think the, in the first Bible teaching I ever recall was the, was the burning bush. But I think this must have been the following week or maybe the following month or whatever. And I, I remember um, you know, being four years old and my, my teacher in Sunday school um, actually had like a little model uh, of a, you know, like maybe it was like some Legos or whatever, and they're, like they're, they're bringing a man down through the roof to be healed, right? And this, this really happened. And so again, it, I mean, the details are, are well known. These guys go up on the roof, uh, you know, they, they take the tiles away, and some, maybe think of like, kind of like terracotta tiles, they remove them, and they, they lower this man down. Um, in front of Jesus, and so I, I gotta wonder, sort of what, you know, I mean, kind of what what this was like. You know, people have asked me before, like, you know, so like when you're teaching or preaching, or whatever, like, are you ever like distracted by things that go on in the room, right? And my answer is always, what went on in the room? <laughs> like, my answer is like, is no. Like, I, I hardly ever hear hear anything at all. Like, there could be, like, you know, like a train going by, I wouldn't hear it, right? The, I mean, someone could die, and I would probably even notice, right? The, which hasn't happened yet. You know, people have fallen asleep uh, repeatedly, but it's, it, um, I, I usually don't notice, right? The, um, but I, I got to think, like, if all of a sudden, like, dust started to come down, you know, like in front of me, cover the Bible, you know, and all of a sudden, like, the, the, the tiles were removed, I gotta think I would notice that, you know what I'm saying? And so, I kind of wonder like what happened like to Jesus. Like was he like locked in? Like did he keep teaching? Did he keep? I mean like, like like the practicality of all this, right? Well, we're not told, but we are told the man is let down. And so I think of like a man so on a bed. You know, maybe there's uh, you know four friends like one on each corner. Maybe they've got these ropes on the corners of this board, and this guy is being let down <laughs> before Jesus. And you got to think that, like, the, the, the crowd has noticed. I mean, Jesus has noticed at this point. And obviously, the man is paralyzed, right? Because he's, he's, he's like, on a, on a bed, right? And so the crowd knows that Jesus is, you know, a healer. They've heard his teaching. They've seen the miracles, right? They all know about the leper that was cleansed, like, yesterday that we just read about. And this guy is, is brought down before Christ. And if I'm in the crowd... So, like, I, I'm, I'm ready, I'm expecting Jesus to heal this guy's paralysis, right? I mean, like, was anyone in the room, like, not expecting that, right? That's got to be what people are thinking. But verse 20, but when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, man, your sins are forgiven you. I'm, I'm like, what? <laughs> like, like, double take. Like, doesn't Jesus know? Like, the guy's not sleeping, like he's paralyzed. That's why he's coming down, like on on the bed, like right. You know, it's like later on in Luke's gospel, we're, we're going to see like Jesus like meets a blind Bartimaeus, and like Jesus questioned Bartimaeus is like, and what can I do for you? <laughs> like, not like what can I do for you? Like the guy's like blind. Jesus, like, he's wearing like the Ray Charles glasses. Like obviously, like the, the man needs to see, right? And Christ asks like, what can I do for you, right? Well, here, like, man, your sins are forgiven you. But Jesus is actually, he says this, right, for a couple of reasons. I think number one, to provoke the scribes and Pharisees, not because he knows why they're there. But number two, I think more importantly, because he knows this is the guy's actually biggest problem, right? It's that his sins aren't forgiven. And so, you know, I would much rather go to heaven, um, a, a paralytic with my sins forgiven, right, than go to hell with my sins and a fully functioning body, right? So this is the man's biggest problem. But verse 21, and the scribes and the Pharisees, they began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So look, if I'm Jesus, right? And, I, and so the Pharisees, like, they're like, hey, I'm like, this guy's blaspheming. 
Like, who can forgive sins but God alone? Like, if I'm Jesus, I don't, I'm like, exactly. <laughs> like, that's the point. I'm God, right? But apparently this is lost on them, right? And actually, we learn that they didn't actually say this. They just thought it. Verse 22. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, right, so they're thinking this, right? He answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning such in your hearts? And then this is his question to them. This is how he teaches them. He says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? And so Jesus is not, he's not teaching here. Like his point is like, you know, which, which sentence has more syllables? Like which is easier to say, right? No, his point is like, which is easier to say and do? And if you think about it, what, I mean, the answer to the question, it, it depends on your perspective, right? It depends on your perspective. Like, whose perspective is this? Is this just like the, the lost Pharisee's perspective? Or is this God's perspective? And, of course, we know ultimately God's perspective, which is easier to actually to say and, and do, to say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk? Well, it's easier to say rise up and walk. And that's easier to do. Like, we can do that today with modern medicine. I mean, lost people can even do that, right? But it's impossible, actually, to forgive someone of their sins. I mean, only God can do that. I mean, that requires the death of the Son of God to bring about. That's the hardest part. So, so see, see, Jesus has actually already done the hardest thing. Back in verse 20, when he says, Man, your, your sins are forgiven you. But from their perspective, as lost, hypocritical, self-righteous Pharisees, in their minds, well, if he can actually heal them, well, then that's actually going to be harder, right? The, um, because the forgiving of sins thing is not actually verifiable. And so, like, see, if you can sort of, like, do that, well, then maybe we'll know that you have the ability to forgive sins. But, you know, it's interesting, right? And I, I, would, I would challenge you to like, maybe kind of think through this. Like, how many times in Scripture is a miracle performed? And there are 37 miracles in Christ's ministry. There's a lot more miracles in other parts of the Bible, right? How many times is a miracle performed? And someone says, well, gee, because of that miracle that was just done, then I'm now going to believe in the Messiah. I'm going to follow Christ. Uh, I mean, don't think about it too much, because the answer is zero times. There's not a single time in Scripture where a miracle is done and someone gets saved. Right? It just doesn't happen, right? But yet in these Pharisees' minds, somehow, like, do the harder thing, and that will verify this easier thing, or verify who you are, or something like that. And so Jesus kind of accommodates in the middle of verse 24. Jesus said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And I love this. Verse 25, immediately, he rose up from before them. He took up what he'd been lying on, and he departed to his own house, glorifying God. I mean, like, what an incredible response of obedience. Like, I, I want to think, like, if I was the guy, like, I'm going to be like, all right, I mean, get up your heel. Like, I'm going to stick around for the rest of the sermon, at least, right? You know? But, but Jesus told him, I want you to go home. Right? And so what does he do? He goes home. Right? That's what you're supposed to do. When Christ commands, you just plain do it. And, and what incredible sort of you know, irony. This, I mean, like the, the man, I mean, he was carried on his bed by his friends and put before Jesus. And now the man leaves with his friends carrying his bed. Right? The whole thing is sort of reversed. And I can't wait to see the video, you know, that, I mean, like, when he gets home, and, like, there's, like, Mrs. Paralyzed Man, you know, and it's, like, she's, she's, like, there, you know, I mean, maybe she's, like, oh, yeah, like, Bob and Joe and Larry came, and they, they took, you know, Paralyzed John, and they, they took him out to that miracle guy, whatever, on the bed, right, and then, like, the door opens, and, you know, John comes strolling in, right, carrying his mat, right, with his friends, they're all singing, glorifying God, she must have been really surprised, I, I don't even know if he was married, I'm just making that stuff up, but, Again, I can't wait to watch this stuff, right? Because these are real people, like you and I. Like, you know, with the real needs, living in a real world, right? But verse 28, verse 26. Now, the man doesn't see this because he went home. But it says, They were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. I mean, they just sort of they can't, they, they can't even process what has happened, because here's a man who is paralyzed, and Christ has healed them. And note that the narrative does not tell us. Uh, and all of a sudden, the scribes and Pharisees confessed their faith in him and, and were redeemed, right? That's not what it says, right? Because that didn't happen. We learn here as the narrative goes on, as you know, 
that they were just sort of agitated more and more, right? The, um, they, they didn't actually believe in, in him at all. And so there's a bunch, a bunch here, a, a bunch uh, there that, that's, that's going on. But we'll um, finish up uh, chapter 5 and get into a bit of chapter 6 um, next week as we keep sort of looking at this. And what we're going to see here uh, is that um, as Jesus, uh, as, as he progresses and moves on here with his, his ministry, that um, man, it's 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 growing. There, there's more and more people who are believing. More are coming in. There's going to be some more disciples who are called. There's going to be some more spectacular miracles that are done, walking on water and other things that, that are coming up. Um, uh, and it's going to keep growing um, a bit before this um, this hostility that's alluded to here in, in that narrative from the, the Pharisees and scribes uh, starts to really take over uh, and things. Uh, get a bit more difficult. That's coming up. Uh, and so let me close in prayer uh, and we'll be dismissed. Father, we're thankful for your word. Uh, we're thankful for your patience with us. Uh, we're thankful for your, um, indeed, your, your miracles in our life and not just the miracles of um, salvation that you've done in our hearts, um, but as well uh, how you've seen fit to, to heal us in, in various ways. Uh, and we're thankful, Lord, just for your patience with us uh, and how you give us opportunity to testify of your work in our, our lives. We do pray now that as uh, that we dismiss and that we leave the room uh, more like Christ than when it began and ask all of this in his name. Amen and amen. amen. See you all next week.